If you're wondering uh, why I passed out Romans chapter 8, we have just left the building of the church by going through the book of Acts. Myself and Michael and Brent have developed a co-teaching process, starting with Acts, I guess, that helps us all to look at our different understanding and perspectives. Everything that these guys have taught has been solid on biblical. But at the same time, our perceptions of what we understand is a little bit different. And because the Holy Spirit is working with us differently in our lives, in His providence, we see more individually than maybe the other one, or different individually. And I think it's a good perspective for us three as we co-teach together to be able to put those perspectives together. Just like in Acts, you'll see Michael and Brent backing up and picking up something on chapter one that I miss. And we know that, but we're okay with that. Uh, as we go through the Gospel of John after finishing Acts, we saw how the church was built. With the Gospel of John, we're going to see how God came down to save the world, us, his elect, his chosen. We are a Reformed church, and in the book of the Gospel of John, you're going to see so many innuendos and statements that tell you how God came to save his elect. And I expect y'all to ask questions, and I expect Michael and Brent to be here to answer them. I'm joking, <laughs> but to help. Uh, it, sent the guys an email this week a couple of times making the point that I, the more I study the Gospel of John, the more inadequate I am to express. So pray that the Holy Spirit shows you and shows whoever is up here in front of you how to emphasize what Christ has come to do. We look at the Gospel of John and we see, and I'm going to get back to the Romans 8 in a minute, we look at the Gospel of John and we see a difference from the other Gospels. Uh, I think Boris called it the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe <clears throat> as given by the Holy Spirit what God wants us to see as they have put down from a position of, I was there, I walked with them, I talked with them, I saw what God came to earth to do. And they're very <clears throat> clear. They're very succinct. However, when you look at John, he's different. They're not, the similarities that you see between the other three Gospels, John is a little bit different. And then to me, in my interpretation, it appears to be that John's given a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder accounting. A very close. You, you read through the Gospel when John says the one that he loved. He's talking about himself. Uh, there's a closeness and there's a relationship with Jesus Christ and all four. But with John, it's more of a, I walk right beside him all this time. There's, there's, anybody in here ever have a best friend? I, you know, if you hadn't, you missed out. <laughs> uh, a best friend can just about read you. And I think the relationship that John and Jesus had while Jesus' ministry was taking, unfolding on earth is different. I'm not saying better. I'm not saying anything, but I, I could see it in the writing. I can see it in the heart. I can see it in the love, the way he <clears throat> relates to us through the scriptures, what Jesus has come to be and say. I think John does a very good job of uh, linking everything together from creation forward. And I want to start that uh, by reading something to you out of Genesis. Excuse me. I always put it there to use, and I never do. Back to Genesis 1. Uh, the reason I gave you the 8th uh, uh, chapter of Romans is as an encouragement. <clears throat> Everything we study and read through the Gospel of John, Romans 8 tells us 
who we are in Christ and what we can expect in Christ. To me, Romans 8 is the greatest encourager I think I've ever picked up. When it, when it, it hit me and my understanding was going to take place, I had been from denomination to denomination to denomination, and, it, and <clears throat> everything was that thick until I began to understand who I was in Christ and what Christ had done to me and what limits he went to to make sure that nothing ever, ever can separate me from the love of God. I can't even do it. I'm his, you're his. In <clears throat> Genesis 1, we start out with I have to use my glasses in these, this fine print. Verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Genesis goes on to define and explain to us how God created all things. There was nothing. There was a void. We're here today, a room full of people that through God's will, God's providence, we're here to serve Christ Jesus. Matthew, excuse me, John starts out same way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, not a thing was made that was, without Him, not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, and that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. He was not, <clears throat> yet the world did not know him. You call that disbelief. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God were born not of the blood, nor of the will, or the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Let's unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> We've read Genesis, and now I'm going to go over to Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. And we're setting the table. In the beginning, remember that. Don't lose sight of it. In the beginning, God created all things. In the beginning, God was Christ Jesus with God. And through him, all things were made. When we talk about Jesus and the love of Christ and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, it's a mirror of our sovereign Father in heaven. They're one in three. Some of us look at God as foreboding, always willing to crash and smush the people that aren't living perfect lives. 
Well, Christ came to show us that's not God. God is love. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. This is Christ. This is our Father in heaven. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Wrapping your head around everything that we've just covered, we, we tend to picture, and, and truthfully, there are three persons in, in the Trinity. But there are mirrors, it's all in one. God is a loving Father, full of love, mercy, and grace. Loved us so much. I get emotional sometimes, so if I, I have to stop and pause, overlook it. But he loved us so much that he took his only son who, became, who came to earth fully God and fully man. Christ suffered the pains of living a life exactly like you and I have and your children have and everybody that's ever been born in the image of God will have come and pass. He knew our hunger. He knew our pain. He knew our hurt. He knew rejection. Everything that tears us up and hurts our feelings and makes us sad and depressed, Jesus Christ went through it. Fully man. John does a great job of pointing out to us Christ was always there. Christ was always in the process with God the Father creating the universe. We tend to put our thoughts of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit in a box of time. Well, who created time? From the time beginning in creation of Earth to today, it's just not even a nanosecond to God. It's all happening at the same time. We have to wrap our heads around the, uh, the chronological views of how things took place. Well, that's not God. That's man having to understand it, and man's the only way to understand it. Each one of us tend, when we look in, in our understanding of God, we, because we're born in sin, and not intentionally, but we begin to develop our own picture of who God is, our own understanding of what Christ came to do rather than understanding what the Word of God says. Read the Word, read the Word, read the Word. Read it often. I can go through the Scriptures and read it. I've been through John so many times. It's, it, it, I, I can't even tell you how many times. Every time, Holy Spirit shows me something I've missed. So continue to read and practice. Practice being a Christian, not because practice makes perfect, but because Repetition gives you greater understanding. Points I want to make sure we understand in the first part of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing made that has been made. And you could jump over to John 14, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. John is right there shoulder to shoulder. All the disciples watched Christ walk this earth and begin his ministry and were with him for the three years that he was alive on earth. He saw it, ate with him, burped with him, whatever else, just like you and I. Cried with him, laughed with him, As I mentioned a minute ago, Jesus was with God in creation. Of everything made. All the love, compassion, joy, care, patience, gentleness, kindness and goodness, strength and passion of Christ 
we'll review and we'll discuss it all through the Gospel of John. But it also is everything that we read, everything that we understand, the joy, the patience, the passion, the love, <clears throat> it's identical to what God is to us. So we think of God as a different, sterner, some of us do. But we need to understand that God loved us so much. In the beginning was God, and with God was Christ. They created the heavens and the earth. They were a reflection of each other. Sometimes we lose track of that. In trying to understand all that we have to go through in our lives, all that we face, and at 75, I probably have faced a whole lot more in a lot of different situations than a bunch of you guys. Come on in. He's, he's got your seat saved with a bulletin. <laughs> in becoming a man, uh, Christ came not only to live like a man and see what we go through, but to be tempted like we're tempted. We're tempted and we fail. We let our anger, we let our passions, we let our lust, we let our desires create all kinds of gaps and barriers from us to God who is a perfect God. And we are, none of us are able to see God. We're none of us able to comprehend and be before God because of the sin in our lives. Can't understand them. Christ came to be the bridge, to be the love, the mercy, the grace, the passion, everything that we need to be able to be with God and to hear God and see God. We talk a lot about the Holy Spirit through the scriptures, and you hear us teach about it and talk about it. One of the things that the children of God are required to do is to live in the Spirit. How do you do that? How is it that any of us are able to live in the Spirit of the Holy God? I mean, we can because it's promised. We could go through scriptures in John 14, 15, and all the way, James, all the way through the test, New Testament and see that we're required to live in the Spirit. How many of us actually get up every morning, read their scriptures, and pray hard with all their passion and heart, Lord, I want to live in your Spirit today. I want your Spirit to be in me and dwell in me and give me your word as a guideline to how I live my life. And we don't, I don't think any of us are able to do that as well as we should be able to do it. As we grow in Christianity, we get stronger. Just remember, pray that God would allow you to walk in his spirit. When you begin to get annoyed at that person cutting you off or the rudeness of somebody in a restaurant or whatever, just ask. I fail all the time and I always repent and ask God to forgive me, but it just shows I'm an example of somebody that don't, does not live in the spirit when I lose my cool. I don't mean let people push you around. I'm not saying that. But we all have a lot of grace given to us, and we all can give a lot of grace. Verse 4. And this was also in Genesis, what we just read. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and will not ever overcome the light of Christ. Living in the Spirit. In our physical life, as we did review Genesis a few minutes ago, we we're reminded that God in three persons, and this is one of the things I try to do is say things two or three times so you hear it. Because if you're like me, your mind's going back and forth. I'm, what is it? Obsessive compulsive. I have to walk by a fence, I have to touch every post. I can't stand it. I look in this room and see these lights, and I love it because none of these lights are a different shade of light, thanks to our deacons. When we first started here, there was a blue one, a yellow one, a white one, uh, daylight, and it drove me crazy. I couldn't stand it. <clears throat> a 
all of us are created in God's image. I have different quirks, you have different characteristics and quirks, and we have different talents, we have different gifts. Each and every one of us are created in God's image. Each and every one of us could be a receiver of the Holy Spirit, that you live in this spirit. And the Spirit of God opens his word to you to understand how to apply every moment, every day of your life, how to raise your children. And we've had a couple of families in here that's had seven or eight kids. Boy, when I talk to those mom and dad, that's one of the biggest encouragements I ever get because they still see Christ at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day. And most of them, the reason they're able to is they go to uh, family worship every day with the children. They teach their children Christ. And I, I know we've said it, but if you never use any of our resources here, we do our best to keep <clears throat> resources for you to have daily devotions with your family. Family worship, we want and encourage you to be there. So we have a physical life and we have limitations, we have talents, we have gifts, we have bents, but it is in him that we have life and that physical life can be good depending on how you choose to live it. And it's your choice, it's my choice. My choice is to try to get stronger and better in the word and to be submissive to the Holy Spirit that I live in the spirit more. We all have a spiritual life. As we live in Christ, his promise to us is that he will send to us a helper, a comforter, an enabler, a paraclete, even a translator of the scriptures. When Karen, my daughter, was about six, seven, and eight, somewhere in that time period, uh, God saved me and called me to himself. I was so woefully behind in scriptures, I didn't have a clue. I was an inch, I wasn't even an inch thick, I was an eighth of an inch thick in depth of knowledge. So I began trying to memorize scriptures. I encourage you, help your children memorize scriptures. Have it in there. It'll come out when it's necessary. One of the scriptures that I was trying my best to memorize, uh, Karen helped me. She would hold the card and Eight-year-old girl, at least eight, uh, well, no older than eight, she would hold the index card. I don't know, anybody here know what an index card is? This, this is from my time, though. <laughs> it's a little cardboard thing about this high, about that long. <clears throat> anyway, she would hold it, and Daddy would try to recite the scripture. And we had a bunch of them, but this is one that over and over again. John 15, 26, and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Promise. God's Spirit is going to come to you and help you understand. He's going to take the Bible, and as you grow in him, in knowledge and in spirit. He's going to open the word to you and your children and your grandchildren to begin to understand better and better. Now this isn't an overnight process. This is long and hard. Uh, sometimes you think your kids didn't pick it up. But if you do this, it'll be there. And when it's time for God to use that child or grandchild, it'll come forth. When I was a little boy, I went to the church, never missed a Sunday, and I heard good preaching, I heard good teaching, and then I turned away when I was about 12 and didn't come back till I was 33. But it was inevitable because I belonged to God. I was one of his chosen, just like you, you guys are. I doubt you would be in this room unless you've been forced if you weren't one of the elect of God. His providence makes sure you are. Anyway, so... Eventually, I began to understand and learn scriptures. Thank goodness for uh, uh, that. My daughter helped me and my wife helped me and I had brothers in Christ. Anybody here that doesn't have a, a spiritual mentor, you go, need to go find one. I don't care how old you are. The older you get, the more you need. <laughs> uh, get, get somebody, ask, pray for it. Don't go out and say, I want you because it's somebody that's well known. Let God bring them to you. He will bring them to you. 
So we have a spiritual life, and then live in our spiritual life. As it tells us in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> we're to seek the Spirit. And we will grow, and that's part of your spiritual life. We will grow in knowledge and understanding and strength and living for Christ. And also there's eternal life that's facing us. So we have physical life, we have spiritual life, and we have eternal life. If you go to John 14, look at verse 1, and I'll read it for you. Jesus tells us, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. You have a physical life, you have a spiritual life while you're here on earth, you have a spiritual life when you're in heaven with Christ. And the mansions is a great thing to think about it, but the, good, the big point here is, I will come again and take you to myself. You get to heaven, we're with Christ. I won't care about the rooms. I won't care about anything else but being in his presence as Michael's been teaching us in Revelations over the last couple of months. <clears throat> Good lessons, and I think we get two of them today. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. His name, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world, uh, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Why would you imagine, as John is talking about the true light, Christ Jesus, why would you imagine nobody recognized him as the Son of God, the Messiah? What could be going on when they listen to and see and hear about the ministry of Jesus Christ in a person's mind that they wouldn't recognize? Everything that this guy does is miraculous. Everything that he says is true to Scripture. When he preached and taught in the temples, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated him, and begin to plot to kill him, to get rid of him. What caused those people not to be able to see the truth and the light? Anybody got any thoughts? Same thing here today. What, what about us that we can't understand that God included, intends for us to live in the spirit in our physical life and to know the love, the joy, peace, the patience, the gentleness, the kindness. Every day that we live, why don't we chase that? Why don't we see that? Yeah. Louder. Louder? The sin in our lives and the fall of man. Yeah, sin in our lives. And sometimes we kind of put it to the side. I'll take care of that someday. But it's the everyday practice of asking the Spirit. One of the things that I just read to you in chapter 6 of uh, you know, all of this is what I would call spiritual blindness. <clears throat> While Christ was walking the earth in his ministry, spiritual blindness, the people couldn't see, they couldn't understand. We have people come into this church as a visitor and we don't know anything about them. Uh, of course, I'm thankful that we as <clears throat> Members of this church always go to those new people and love them and welcome them and trying to encourage them to come back. Uh, we don't know where they are in Christ. Some of them might be solid. Some of them may not be. Just like me when I was in my early to late 20s not being in Christ. I was spiritually blind. I could not understand what you understand. People coming into this church and some of the people in our church cannot understand what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. 
because they don't live in the Spirit. They don't know the Word. We're to be patient and kind and encouraging and teaching to them. Not to ostracize against them and say, you're not one of us. We're to say, just like Christ says, come on, I need you. I want you. You're mine. You belong to me. That's the true light that John is talking about, that we want in our souls and we want in our hearts. What does it take? Verse 11 again. He came to that which was his own, that he created. That's us. He created us. But his own did not receive him, yet to all, all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Where is, the, where is the missing link here that every one of us have? None of us understand. Here's the offer. Here's the gift. Here's the true light of the world. And we're over here. And we're that far apart. I mean, it could be that far apart or it could be zillion miles apart. There is one thing that we need in order to believe in Christ. If you don't have it, you won't. If you think you have it, and you don't love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, you need to stop and think about it. That one word is faith. When we're told to believe in Christ, we can't believe in Christ without the faith. Where does that faith come from? Any guesses? Go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I'm going to go to Ephesians 1. And, and the reason I'm going to do that is because every time uh, for the last couple of chapters in Acts is when Brent Detloff uh, uh, would teach, he would, re, he, would, he would make a comment. But I'm going to use a word that Phil uses all the time. And that word is but God. Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 2 explains what he's talking about too and it tells us how we get that faith. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience are anyone that does not belong to Christ among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, we were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind, all, all of us, everybody in mankind are children of wrath. And here's my favorite word, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love of which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that none of us can boast, I did it. For we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. That God prepared beforehand, those good works he's talking about is what you're to be doing, and I'm to be doing all that belong to him and love him. John lays it out like a lawyer. Every T is crossed and I dotted. It, it, from the beginning, John lays out who God is, who Christ is, how much he loved us, what he loved us to be and sent the help for us to be exactly as the workmanship he created us to be. You got gifts and talents, go use them. One of the things that I picked up we have to use a humidifier in the wintertime because I gotta have humidity. 
So I had to buy a little thing that's like drops that you put in to help keep it clean. And when I open the box and I look in here, and I'm talking about being a witness. All of us are a witness of Christ and whatever you do or say. All the instructions and all the stuff that are on the page in the back, very bottom of it, it's got John 13, 34. Love one another. It's pretty neat when you run across a witness like that. I see it. I know you see it here and there. There's a couple little, uh, well, I won't get into that, but a witness. As we already said, he gave us the right to be children of God. Wow. It's an adoption because I'm a son of disobedience. The gift he gave me to have faith, to love him, and put him before myself, which is hard for us humans to do. That grace is there through Christ. It's not natural descent. It's a grafting in. We who believe and have faith belong to Christ Jesus. And go back to those copies I gave you of Romans 8. Put it in your Bible. Take it out. Hold on to it. And keep going back and looking at it through the Gospel of John to see that you belong to Him. To me, that's amazing when I go through and read Romans 8. That nothing can take me away from Him. I might live wrong. I might make mistakes. Of course I do. All of us do. But nothing can separate me from the love of God because I belong to Him and He paid the price through Christ Jesus. Read verse 14 a few minutes ago. We're going to go through it a little bit more and have a little bit of discussion about what it says. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Who's the Word? Christ Jesus. In the beginning, before time ever started, the Word of God was there in Christ Jesus. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, and this word is one of my favorites, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has passed me because he was before me out of his fullness. We have all received grace in place of grace already given. Couple of points and then we're going to close. What we've read through these first 14 verses in John, we've seen seven witnesses. And I want you to help me defend how was Christ witnessed to in these 14 verses? Seven different witnesses. I'll give you the easy ones God the Father is a witness of Christ. God the Son is the witness of God and, and the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is the witness who Jesus Christ is. Jesus was his own witness by how he lived and moved and the things that he did. We have another witness in the room with us too, right now. Of course the Holy Spirit's with us, but we have Scripture. That's four. Anybody want to jump in and with John the Baptist, right? We just read it. John the Baptist was a witness of Christ in front of everybody. Six, what happened that we saw and we read in these 14 verses? We saw the works of Christ. We saw Christ working in the world. We saw the evidence that Christ is God on earth. The seventh one. Seventh witness of Christ Jesus is you and me. We're the seventh witness. Think about it. We all have a story. We all have a life. If you have faith, you want to believe, and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you believe, and faith will be there. If you earnestly pray and seek it. I'm reading through voice. I've got a couple of commentaries I like to use. Carson, Boas, Sproul, etc. But... Uh, one of them was talking about witnessing to a young man. I think it was probably Boris because he was an, uh, a 
seminary. The young man had doubts. And if it was voice, he encouraged him to go through and read the Gospel of John and ask the Holy Spirit to open you up to understand the fullness and the truth of his work. Think about it, ask for it, and read it. And I do believe it was Boris said it, it wasn't 30 days later to a young man come to him and profess his faith and belief. You can't outrun it. The hounds of heaven will chase you down and put you in front of God. You're going to be in front of them anyway. Any thoughts or any questions anybody has? We'll stop here and pick up with verse 17 next week. Anybody want to add anything? I encourage you to go back through and read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, all the way through. Read ahead so you'll know what to expect. If you have questions, we'd love to hear them. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, your son, your love, your sovereignty, your majesty, and the glory, Father, that you have shown all of us. Give us the hearts to know you and hear you, follow you, and be a witness to all those around us. These things I ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank y'all.